Mum, Mr Fellows lied. These are my words as a five-year-old little girl about her first primary school teacher. Mum, Mr Fellows lied. I was outraged. I could not believe that this was happening. I have changed the names, but this really did happen. My mum, who probably thought that is ridiculous, but never mind, we'll roll with it, which I think quite a lot of parents say quite a lot of the time, said, well, darling, what makes you say that? What did Mr Fellows say? So I explained that Mr Fellows had told us that there was going to be a special child joining our school, that this child might need us to be more patient, we might have to spend more time maybe helping and explaining things. That we would need to be really careful and kind and considerate. Now, according to my five-year-old brain, the only student that had started at school that day was my best friend, Jay. Now, what you need to know about Jay is that Jay has Down syndrome. But to me, Jay was Jay, and him coming to my class didn't match the description of this child that my teacher was telling me was going to come. So I quite rightly concluded that Mr Fellows had lied. You see, as a child of five, I didn't see the difference. I didn't see the difference between Jay and myself. He was my friend and I loved him. The difference was invisible. There's something quite beautiful about that innocence that we have as children where we don't see the differences. We only see our love and care for the person that we know. In the Bible, Jesus says in Matthew's Gospel that it is necessary to become like a child to be part of God's kingdom. He says, unless you change and become like these little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It made me think maybe it is this aspect of a child's character, the not seeing difference part of it, that is maybe what Jesus was talking about here. I'm not quite sure when I realised that there was a difference between me and Jay. I'm not sure when I realised that he had Down syndrome or even what Down syndrome was. Because that's not the important point. What is important is that our differences have never stopped the love for my friend. It's sad, isn't it, when differences can get in the way, when they become the focus of a relationship rather than what unites us and holds us together. We've had an example in the news this week, haven't we, of a few people in our country to the missed penalties in last Sunday's England-Italy Euro final. It gave people an excuse to vent hatred based on race and difference. And it's really sad. In our passage from Ephesians today, we're going to explore how as Christians, through Jesus, our ideas of difference and how we do relationships with one another are transformed. You see, there's a lot in the letter to the Ephesians about transformation. The letter was being sent to the church in Ephesus but it was also probably a round robin letter that was sent to a lot of churches in the area. You see, it was an important message to get across. Some writers believe that Paul wrote the letter in order to inspire and expand the horizons of his listeners, to help them to better understand God's grace and love and eternal purposes. You see, this letter was written to help the listeners understand more about God's love and how we're being transformed by it. Not only how it impacts our relationship with God, but also with each other. In this particular chapter, in the first part that we looked at last week, we explored the idea that the way we live, living a full life, doing good works, is part of that transformation journey. And that it's possible only because of what Jesus has done for us by dying and being raised to new life, which reconciles us to a restored relationship with God. And we were questioned, weren't we, are we dead or alive? Are we being transformed into fully alive people that want to live for Jesus in everything that we do? And in today's passage, that idea of transformation continues. 
You see, in the second half of chapter 2, Paul digs further into that transformation process. And he explores how belief in Jesus and following him doesn't just transform our relationship with God, but it also transforms our relationship with one another. It challenges listeners then, and us now, to think about who we are as believers in Jesus. How do we want our relationships to demonstrate our love for him? What differences can divide us and what can we do to avoid that? And what does how we relate to each other say to the community around us? These are some of the questions I want us to think about and reflect in our sermon this morning, to think about what might God be saying to us about this. So as I've said, the letter was written to the church in Ephesus, but probably was heard by other churches too. And Paul, in the beginning of these verses from verse 11 and 12, is talking to the Gentile believers. He's saying to them and reminding them about who they were before, before Jesus, reminding them again. He says in verse 12, you were without Christ. They were aliens, foreigners, not recipients of God's promises to the Jewish people, which we can read about in the Old Testament. But now, in verse 13, Paul says to them, but now it's all changed. You've been brought near by the blood of Christ. Paul goes on to say why that's significant to the Gentiles, that they're no longer aliens separate to the people of God, that Jesus' action of dying on the cross has brought the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers together into one family. He describes Jesus in these verses, in verse 14, as our peace, making both groups into one. It talks about, in that verse, breaks down dividing walls, reconciles both groups to God in one body or one household, depending on the translation you read, and puts to death hostility between the two, so that in verse 18 we read so that through Jesus both Gentile and Jewish believer would by one spirit have access to God the Father you see at the time of this letter there were in some cases two distinct groups you had sort of the Jewish believers who had been circumcised to mark them as the chosen people of God and then you had the pagan Gentile believers who were the uncircumcised. And there were some people that liked that division, that separation. You see, in Jewish law, Gentiles were seen as unclean. For a Jew to mix with a Gentile would have made them unclean too. To make sure they never mixed together, even the temple in Jerusalem had a physical dividing wall that separated the inner courts where the Jewish believers would worship from the Gentile, the court of the Gentiles. There was a physical barrier separating them. They were kept separate. So it could be said that there was a bit of a history between these two groups historically. And now you've got Jews and Gentiles coming to know Jesus and love Jesus. You see, There was still a sense at this time when Paul wrote this letter that some people felt that the Gentile believers were less than. They weren't full members of the church. And though many thought the Gentile believers had to become, and sorry, my words came out of my mouth before I thought about it. Many thought that the Gentile believers had to become Jewish by becoming circumcised in order to be fully paid up members. So there was that idea in that sense of separateness but it's clear that in this letter Paul is saying that that's not how they should be that's not how their relationship should be he explains that Jesus's death and resurrection his blood his work of reconciliation means that there aren't two types of believer the Jewish believer and the Gentile believer but both have equal status that Jesus, the Prince of Peace, bringer of peace, has made the two into one. 
Jesus brought up this point in another part of the Bible when he describes himself as the good shepherd in John's Gospel, chapter 10. These are the words he says. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. And in the story of the early Christians in the book of Acts that we've been looking at, one of Jesus' friends, Peter, receives a vision from God. And in that vision, it completely changes the way he thinks about the Gentile believers and his attitude to them. And he tells a crowd that are with him after he's had this vision, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. You see, they weren't separate anymore. And it's because of what Jesus has done that has enabled the Gentiles to no longer be classed as alien, impure, unholy, but they are now included in God's plan. Paul makes it clear that the Gentile believers are not replacing the Jewish believers, but together they're becoming something new. They're being reconciled with everything together, bringing peace to a broken and hostile world. I wonder where we, as believers, can bring peace to our broken and hostile world. When I moved to Ramsgate about a month ago now, my garden had a wonderful selection of wild flowers, which is a really nice way of saying it was overgrown. But within that overgrownness and wildness were some amazing flowers and some gorgeous wild poppies. And that attracted all the butterflies and insects, and it was really beautiful to sit out and watch and to see all this activity going on. And it made me think, this letter to the Ephesians, that this idea of the Jewish and Gentile believers becoming a new thing, being transformed, reminded me of the butterfly. Or maybe the butterfly reminded me of this transformation. Now, I am not by any means an expert in butterfly transformation and caterpillar transformation, but it's always fascinated me that how the butterfly is so different from the caterpillar, how it transforms in such an amazing way. And yet, if you look really hard, you can sort of see the caterpillar within the butterfly, but it's completely new, completely transformed. And it made me think how that can be the same for us in our relationship with Jesus, how we as believers are transformed when we accept who Jesus is, when we believe in his power, when we say, thank you, Jesus, for dying and raising to life for me. We are transformed into something new, and we're transformed together. See, this transformation occurs no matter what our background is. See, in the, in the passage, both Jewish and dental believers were being transformed together into something new, and all of us Christians are united together because of what Jesus has done for all of us. And that is the central thing that we have in common. The thing that unites us and should be our focus rather than our differences. Paul doesn't use the image of a butterfly in this passage, but he uses the image of a temple. In verses 19 to 22, He says these words, that yes, they are being transformed into a temple worthy of God dwelling in their hearts, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, which is why it's really important that we know both our Old Testament and New Testament in the Bible, because it gives us that background and that foundation of our faith. And so being built on that foundation, we're then drawn together because of Jesus the cornerstone, the thing that holds us all together. 
no matter what our background, this is for Gentile and Jewish alike. You see, our background is not what matters. Where we grew up isn't what matters, where we were educated, if we were educated. None of that matters. But it's how we live now that does as we're being transformed. And this transformation is ongoing. As Christians, God lives in each of us through his Holy Spirit within our hearts. And it allows God to be present in each situation that we encounter. As individuals, as a church, as Christians living in the same town, as the worldwide church even, we, how we live shows something to the world, gives a glimpse of Jesus. And it isn't just how we live by what we do, but how we live by how we live and show and love care for each other. Chapter 3 will go on and talk a little bit more about this image of temple and being grown together. But what does the passage we read this morning mean for us now, sitting here in the church in Ramsgate or wherever we are watching from back home? Normally, I would say that for us today, it might not be talking to us about divisions between Jewish believers and non background Jewish believers, but I've never lived in a town with a Jewish synagogue before. But I think what it is saying is that we as Christians have a role and responsibility to model ourselves as peaceful, loving relationships and seeking to bring Jesus' peace to the world. As I've already said in our news this week, we don't have to look far to see those relationships of hatred and not of peace. That response of those few to those missed penalties is really sad. That we're sad to think that we live in a world where there's still hatred and hostility towards different people. And there's divisions against each other. I wonder how we've asked ourselves this week, what can we do to bring peace into situations like that? How can we fight against those racist feelings and thoughts and comments that come out? What role do we have? And it's sad as well that sometimes hostility and divisions can come even in churches. I don't know if you've heard stories of that, I sadly have, where there's friction and tension and hostility even amongst people who believe the same thing, who are, who are trusting in Jesus. Because as followers of Jesus, we are being transformed into his likeness in our relationship with God and in our relationship with others. The church isn't perfect, but Jesus is And he has given us our gifts, our talents, to be transformed and used to praise him, to show others who he is, to reflect Jesus, the bringer of peace. So I wonder, how can we demonstrate that peace in how we behave towards each other? Are there any hostilities in our hearts that we might be harboring against somebody else? How can we let them go? Sometimes those hostilities are due to differences, differences in how we worship or how we serve. But that shouldn't be what divides us. That should be what makes us strong and grow together. Bonded by Jesus, that uniting figure. See, this is the focus of today's passage, that all Christians are equal in Christ. And so there's no act of service or style of worship that makes us a better Christian to anyone else. My call to ordained ministry doesn't make me a better Christian than anyone else. There is no such thing. We're all equal. We are all equal because of Jesus and the way we relate to each other should show that. We're not always going to agree on every little detail in life. That's just not how it is. But it is, in fact, a big witness to others in how people from very different backgrounds, which we would find amongst ourselves, can still love and care for each other. A message I think our world needs to hear and to see through us modeling that. 
So as we finish, let us think about where this week we are going to allow Jesus to transform our relationships. How can we love and care for each other? Where do we need help to break down barriers that divide, whether in our own hearts or in relationships around us? And where can we show and share Jesus' peace this week? Amen.